All right. Welcome back, guys. This is Telltale. I'm Emily. I'm Greg. And today we're going to be doing our book review on the Castle of Tr Otranto. Is that how you say it? I think a so. A Toronto. We might be slaughtering it. We don't know. It's we like, don't care. <laughs> yeah, we don't care. But before we do that, we want to give you kind of an overview of some of the new books coming out in March that we're pretty excited about. Yes, this is something new we want to start doing is, is talk about what is coming up that might be of interest to any of you that watch our channel. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of reprints, but also some excellent new books. And so I just want to quickly go through these. I'm not going to talk too much about them, basically just list them all. Um, coming March, well, this is going to air March 5th, but coming out on March 1st or four days ago as you watch <laughs> this, um, Arcturus Press, which is a, a publisher I'm not familiar with, they are publishing in hardcover Daniel Defoe's A Journal of the Plague Year, which is Ooh. a book which has gotten a lot of interest this past year because mm -hmm. of the plague year. Yeah, um, <laughs> relevant. Another publisher I never heard of called Peter Owen is publishing a hardcover, is doing a hardcover reprint edition of Anna Kavan's Ice, which is an interesting surrealistic dystopia from, Ooh. I believe, the 1950s or 1960s. I love a good dystopia. And she's she's a female author that not hasn't got a lot of attention. She mm -hmm. deserves to get a lot more attention because I haven't read any of her works, but what I've heard about it, it is really, really different. I'll Very surreal. Kind pencil of pencil her into one of our, our yeah. reviews sometime. That looks that sounds good. And another publisher is coming out with the classic H.P. Lovecraft collection. I got to note that. Of course. Um, I, it didn't list what stories are in it, but hey, it's got to be things like Color Out of Space, Dunwick Horror, Shadow Out of Time, Call of Cthulhu, things like that. Mm -hmm. And that, that's coming out in trade paperback March 1st. On March 2nd is coming out, or already came out as you hear this, the sequel to A Memory Called Empire, which was a Hugo Award-winning novel from... 2019 by Arcady Martina, Tor is bringing out number two of that series called A Desolation Called Peace, and I've got that one on pre-order. <laughs> Haven't finished Memory Called Empire because we've just been so we've busy been with reading busy other with all things, this but stuff. I want to get back to it because it, what I read of it so far was really good, and mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to A Desolation Called Peace, and maybe we can review them on this mm -hmm. channel. Um, but that's coming out hardcover, ebook, and audiobook March 2nd. It, it's available. Another March 2nd, coming from a publisher called Hard Case Crime, mm -hmm. is Later by Stephen King. Don't know much about it, except I'm sure it's one of his Bachman-style mysteries. It's Stephen King. I mean, yeah. if you like his work, you'll like all of it. <laughs> well, some, some people that like more the, the Shining mm -hmm. and Carrie and Salem's Lot are not into those Bachman-style mysteries that he mm. writes, but um, they have found a, a strong audience and so he keeps putting them out there because people still do love those books mm -hmm. and that's coming out in trade paperback ebook and audiobook on march 2nd also on march 2nd and i've got this one on pre-order too from barnes and noble i've got a signed edition coming Ooh. clara and the sun clara and the sun by kazuo ishiguro sorry if i said that wrong Coming out from Alfred A. Knopf in the, in the United States, Faber is coming out with a really cool designed, um, like a die cut, revealing some, some cool graphics Ooh. on the inside, but that's in the UK. I haven't figured out how to get a hold of that yet, because I really would like it, because I think the graphic design is awesome on it. Um, the Knopf version is just normal yeah. book with yeah. normal jacket. Uh, dust jacket. Yeah. But still kind of nice looking. And it is Ishiguro, who is a major, major literary author who kind of borders on science fiction. And mm -hmm. I believe he won the Nobel Prize. Did he? I think so. Oh. We'll have to Google that later. Pretty sure he won the Nobel Prize. Um, so that's coming out in hardcover, trade paperback, ebook, and audiobook <laughs> all mm -hmm. at once, March 2nd. Um, coming up March 9th, another 
publisher I never heard of called Tuttle Publishing mm. is releasing In Ghostly Japan by Lafcadio Hearn. Lafcadio Hearn is a guy, he was, he was British. He went and he lived in Japan for a lot of years oh, okay. and he basically collected ghost tales. That's so cool. And wrote them up. I feel like Japanese ghost stories and folklore is just so fascinating. Mm -hmm. I have like several animes that are based in that and it's just mm -hmm. real good stuff. Real good stuff. I want to read something by Lef Lefkady O'Hearn. I've never read any of his works. I've just been hearing about it and that they're, they're really awesome. So Tuttle Publishing is releasing in trade paperback a collection of his stories on March 9th. That's cool. On March 23rd, Tor, in its Essentials line, is releasing a reprint of the classic... Hugo winning novel by John Brunner, Stand on Zanzibar. This is one of the great science fiction novels from the 1960s. Mm -hmm. One of those books that transcended the pulp origins of science fiction to create a work that's more literate. Mm -hmm. um, that is kind of, you know, along with Le Guin and Ellison and mm -hmm. Ballard and all this typifies science fiction of the new wave of the 1960s and early 1970s and a lot of great books were published at that time mm -hmm. so that's coming out from tour essentials trade paperback on march 23rd also on march 23rd i had to throw this in i've been wanting to read dean Koontz for some time i see stuff everywhere thrift stores regular yeah. bookshelves like everywhere you well, can you cannot go anywhere that sells books and not find his stuff He's a very he he has been a very prolific author writing since the 1960s, mm -hmm. mostly horror, some thriller. Um, he's had movies based on his s novels. Um, the one that that got me interested in Dean Coots was one where I forget the name of the movie. At the very beginning, this this kid murders his family, oh. and then he dies. And they show him going down into hell. Oh, that coolest, sounds cool. Coolest special effects. At, Ooh, at that, I want to see know, that. This was released in the early 90s, and it just blew me away. That's and cool. I can The name of it just won't stick with me. Somebody out there, leave a comment. Please comment what the movie what is, is if you I know. I want to get that movie. Um, but I also want to get the book. But I also want to start reading Dean Koontz, because I never have read his books. Mm -hmm. I see him everywhere. So I've got this one on pre-order, too. Mm -hmm. The other Emily. <laughs> <laughs> it's my double kinger. My uh, evil twin. Coming out from Thomas and Mercer in hardcover ebook and audiobook on March twenty third. And I pre ordered it from I believe it was Barnes and Noble mm -hmm. again. And uh so that should come and that'll be my first taste of actual books by Dean Koontz instead of just going seeing the movies. That's fun. And and you know, Dean Koontz at one time, he was on par with Stephen King in the mm -hmm. horror genre. The two of them, they were the hor you. You go into the bookstores back then, B. Dalton, Walden. Mm -hmm. You go into those stores, and you'd see lots of books. The only horror books you'd see at the front of the store were Dean Koontz and Stephen King. Yep, they were the giants in the genre. And Dean Koontz has kind of fallen out of favor. I think his books aren't on the bestseller list anymore. But um, I think he's still got it. I think he's still an excellent writer and deserves to be better known. So I want to read that book. Mm -hmm. And I want to, want to dig deeper into Dean Koontz and, and learn more about his work. Anyway, moving along, because we got to get to our review. Yeah. Um, Tachyon Publications on March 30th is releasing a book by Bruce Sterling, Robot Artists and Black Swans, in hardcover and ebook. And unfortunately. Intriguing. Title. I don't really know more about it than that. Bruce Sterling is one of the original cyberpunk authors okay. with William Gibson. Yeah. Okay. Uh, matter of fact, I believe it was him and Gibson that wrote The Difference Engine together. Oh, yeah. That. And uh, so that ought to be a really good book. Sterling, I don't think, ever disappoints people with his cyberpunk work. And another, another reprint coming out on March 31st from Saga Press. Never heard of them either. Mm -hmm. Um, I only know Saga as a video game company. Um, coming out I think in trade it's Sega. Paperback. I can't even remember yes, now. Sega. Sega. <laughs> so Close enough. Got it wrong. Words are hard. <laughs> I'm not a not it's a Monday. gamer, so um, but gotta stop going filming to, these on Mondays then, because yeah. we get a case and for Mondays. After a whole day of work. I know. Um, anyway, they're releasing a reprint of Clive Barker's 
um, important novel, Weave World. That is, I haven't read it, but what I've heard of it, that is his coolest, most imaginative piece. And that's coming out in trade paperback on March 31st. So a lot of really excellent new books coming out this month. And I'm, I'm getting most of this from isfdb.com. Mm-hmm. They list all these. Locust Magazine also lists, lists all the upcoming books on their website. And digging into research for this, I was just floored by the huge number of books being published every month. Mm-hmm. And just... You know, I mean, this doesn't even scratch the surface of yeah, all the books. Yeah, there are that, hundreds the and books. hundreds. It's just amazing the number of books that are published every month. And what a great time with a pandemic mm-hmm. to be publishing. I find that too. Like, I feel like people are cranking up movies and TV shows like it's nobody's business right now, especially for streaming. It's mm-hmm. because we need it. <laughs> like, I know we're coming kind of, we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel with this pandemic that's going on. But I definitely think, like, I have to say I appreciate all the entertainment that's being developed during this time and being filmed. Yes. And, like, everybody who's investing their time and making something for other people to be entertained by, like, that is so underappreciated. Well, and the publishing industry kind of went through something similar to what the music industry was going through when michael jackson released thriller Mm -hmm. you know the publishing industry was kind of in in decline at the time that some genius decided to publish harry potter and that changed the game and we've seen just this incredible blossoming not just the publishing but specifically a fantasy and science mm-hmm. fiction in the years since huge then. surge of it mm-hmm. and it's not slowing down yeah and i like that i love that a lot I, when i was young even when i was your age mm-hmm. really young um baby just a baby <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> way way back then uh to be a science fiction and fantasy fan was something you had to kind of hide because people would look at you like you had a third eye or something yeah. growing out of your head. You were this weird creature. Now geek culture is cool, so <laughs> and, all this stuff is too. Everybody's into it, and it's, it's just amazing. I, I love it because mm-hmm. everybody's discovering what us oldsters knew way back in the 1970s mm-hmm. or even earlier. Yep. Um, for some people, way back in the 1930s and 40s, they discovered this genre and saw that that this was the it's, best. Yeah, and it's viable. And so I, I love that it's become very mainstream. Yes, I think too. Where, like it, it stretches, it stretches the brain a lot more. Mm-hmm. Whoop! Cats are fighting. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's mad. Heard a cat hiss. Um, oh no. But I think it stretches the brain a lot. Like, I think people appreciate it because it makes them envision things that are very outside our own world, and it gives them a sense of escape. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why it's becoming so popular, because right now, life sucks. Who wants to write about pandemic COVID-19? I certainly don't want to hear about it ever again once it's over and done with. So it's like, might as well. Might as well write something for the people that want to escape reality. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot, though. And so as we've discussed in the past, fantasy in literature really goes back to the very roots of literature, Mm -hmm. where realistic stories kind of have their origins in the 1800s. Fantasy goes all the way back to the Epic of Gilgamesh. It goes back to the Bible. Yeah, pretty much it's all Earth. The Odyssey. Their version of urban myths Mm -hmm. are old-timey folklore now, but that's basically fairy tales were morality stories to Mm -hmm. you know tell your children to behave and you know it kind of helped to explain unusual circumstances and situations and now we write them for pleasure just for the sake of building a world but i mean i think it's really it's times have changed but have Mm -hmm. they really it's a lot of unspeakable not really it's always kind of been there but more as as like you know you didn't have what was considered to be a direct fantasy novel or science fiction Mm -hmm. novel they just kind of dabbled in it Mm -hmm. until 1764 yep when a guy named horace walpole wrote and published a book called the castle of otranto here we go this is an interesting book horace walpole 
And this is an interesting fact. Horace Walpole was the son of the first British prime minister. Oh, interesting. So he was born with a silver spoon. He had gobs of money. Mm -hmm. Before he started writing anything, he built Strawberry Hill, which anybody studying architecture remembers that as a very significant Gothic revival Mm -hmm. architecture in the 1700s. This guy was the guy for Gothic. Yeah, he, he wanted to build his own castle. So he built Who Strawberry Hill. Who doesn't, though? If well, you don't, you're sad. No. <laughs> I just want the dungeon. There's people I want to see down there. <laughs> I just want the whole castle. Like, I want... Anyway. Okay. That's just me. Big ball gowns, long, large staircases. The draft I could do without, though. Mold. Yeah. Dripping, dripping water. I don't know. I found that so soothing. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Chinese water torture. Yep. Um... So anyway, he built this castle for himself called and called it Strawberry Hill. And then he lived there and he didn't have to work. So he didn't have much else to do. So he started writing and he wrote some plays. But he wrote this book called The Castle of Otranto, which was weird. Really weird. Totally un, unheard of on his day's standards. Yeah, there was no gothic anything. Like. But he, Walpole was into... The Gothic era, mm-hmm. era, and Gothic cathedrals and and the old English castles and stuff and and that medieval history, he was really into it and he wanted to, um, you know, like like I said, he he wanted to build his own medieval castle, mm-hmm. and he wanted to write a story that brought that medievalism back, mm-hmm. but. Of course, he wasn't historically accurate. No, not at all. It was more his own fantasy of what medievalism and gothicism was all about. Mm -hmm. So it was first, kind of the first truly gothic fiction, fantasy fiction. It was the first gothic Mm -hmm. fiction. Absolutely. And changed everything. It was weird. So I'm going to preface with this first before I go into the synopsis. I had a really hard time trying to figure out if this was meant to be a comedy or not. Okay. Um, I couldn't tell because some of the characters were just so absurd Mm -hmm. and chatty that I'm like, is this normal? Is this meant to be comedic relief? Are they all meant to be comedic relief? I don't understand. Is this just dark humor? So I had a hard time with that. And I do know that this was originally written like this wasn't originally written in English, was it? Yeah, it was. Was it? Okay. Well... Here's the thing. It was written in English, but it was supposedly a translation of an Italian book by some by some author. Okay. But it was actually Horace Walpole, just playing up, trying to pull the wool over everybody's eyes. Which I did appreciate (laughs) because there is another author who does the same thing. He wrote *The Princess Bride*. (laughs) Okay. Have you ever read the introduction to that, or any prefaces or anything? I saw the movie. I didn't. If you ever read the book. He has this whole fake how he found information about this. So I think it's kind of funny how that you see this first done here. You don't really see a lot of people doing the I'm going to fake it till I make it sort of thing about the writing of their book. Um, So the book is actually. I'll go into the synopsis right away. The Castle of Otranto is about this prince and this princess are going to get married to try and solidify some alliances between nations. Of course. The day they're about to get married, a giant helmet of a knight falls from the sky and crushes the prince, who's kind of sickly anyway, but he dies instantly, and the father is so upset that his son has died, he's just, like, angry that this alliance isn't going to happen, so he decides he's angry enough that he's going to convince his wife, the queen, to divorce him using some kind of religious banter (laughs) and marry this other princess to solidify these alliances. So the whole time he's running around the castle trying to find this princess to force her to marry him, she's running away from him and there's this random impoverished young man who just keeps getting involved. He keeps like somehow being in the wrong place at the wrong time. He's like the Mm -hmm. most unlucky. Theodore, is that his name? I think his name is Theodore. I think so. Yeah. So he is like the most unlucky peasant ever. (laughs) Because he just, every time something goes wrong, he's there and accused of something and being threatened and shoved in a dungeon or, you know, 
somehow always weaseling his way out of it by some happenstance or like just charming his way out of stuff. So the king eventually, like he can't find the girl. He finds out she's over at the parish. So he's trying to, you know, go and retrieve her, bring her back to the castle. And oh, it, the whole thing is just, when you think the story can't lose its mind anymore, it does. So random, like, large knight armor is being randomly found as ghostly images throughout the castle. Like, at one point, there's a leg randomly in the Great Hall. Mm -hmm. And then at another point, someone's going up a winding staircase, and there's a giant gauntlet of a hand on the staircase. Mm -hmm. And, of course, this giant helmet is, like, disembodied somehow and, like, floating around and weird shit. It just keeps randomly happening everywhere. So then there's this whole weird banter about the princess. And I can't even go into detail because there is so much. Like, you have to read the story to realize how absurd this thing is. But ultimately what happens is that the princess is, who keeps trying to run away from the king, so she isn't forced to get married, her father, who was missing, suddenly shows up with his entourage. And then the king, the two kings are trying to, like, find other ways of marrying someone's daughter off to the other whatever kind of situation so that the alliance can be built and there's a whole bunch of other misunderstandings only for there to be this prophecy that once all these pieces of this armor come together that castle is supposed to like fall and someone else is supposed to become king mm -hmm. and that's ultimately where the story ends is when this does happen and a princess dies that's all i can tell you <laughs> like it's so all over the place, mm -hmm. and the banter is so... It's fast and witty, but it's also very dry. So mm -hmm. you can't tell if it's meant to be a comedy. It's everywhere. Like, yeah. there are so many details I had to leave out just because I could be here for five hours just trying to describe <laughs> to you the weird dynamics between all these characters. Mm -hmm. And because of that, and because it is also hard to follow, I only gave this three stars Yeah. on Goodreads. Yeah. Um, it is really hard to follow, and it just keeps losing its mind to the point where you're like, where is this even going anymore? Uh -huh. Like, <laughs> thank God someone died at the end, because that's the only way that poor girl could have gotten closure. <laughs> Theodore's a prince by some weird thing. The peasant mm -hmm. ends up being a prince by some yep. weird thing. Like his the, father comes back. His, from yeah, his father is actually crusades, the priest. Think, yeah, yeah, his father actually ends up being the priest at the parish at the castle. Like, how are these coincidences happening? Where is all this random gigantic armor coming from? Mm -hmm. Like, what the hell? <laughs> None of it makes sense at no. all. No, like some of it does, but most of it is just like people just being irrationally angry, stupid, and gossipy. Yeah. And, like, a ton of misunderstandings. There are so many circumstances where things change because, like, somebody misunderstood someone else or somebody didn't see who was being referred to, but they assumed. And it was just a whole lot of stupid. <laughs> <laughs> that pretty well sums it up. Yeah. yeah. Like, um, it, it comes across as a comedy to me. Interestingly, this novel has such a huge influence down through the years over so much that has been written since immediately it influenced people like like Anne Radcliffe and um, Gregory Lewis in the the stories that they wrote where they basically took the same story but made it a little better and and better not writing. hard to do with yeah. this one. but but they were inspired by it that's true. and they took it and they ran with it and and so today Pretty much everything that has a castle, a damsel in distress, a family curse, owes the castle of Otranto mm -hmm. a debt of gratitude for creating that whole, the whole genre. Scenario. And even science fiction, because science fiction has its roots in novels like Frankenstein, Frankenstein has its roots in the Gothic coming from this first Gothic mm -hmm. novel. So... You know, all of fantasy and science fiction owes its history to the foundation of this one goofy work. That said, the amazing thing that so much great literature came from it is that 
this book is awful. It's really bad. Like, if it was a play, <laughs> uh, like a comedy play, mm -hmm. this would be great. Well, and that's how it reads. It feels yeah, it like reads a drama. like a play. It feels very much like he intended this to be a stage play. Yes. And it just never made it. Or, and like, or he took it to theater owners and they said, you've got to be kidding. Yes, <laughs> seriously. So published it as a book. It is just <laughs> so all over the place, though. Like, every twist and turn, lots of people get stabbed, some people die, mm -hmm. some people don't. Some mm -hmm. people are sentenced to death. Mo poor theater. This <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows he's a prince, but is actually a prince. Mm -hmm. He's, like, sentenced to death, like, eight times. Yeah. <laughs> like, this king just, he keeps getting into, oh, I could go on. Like, this book is so crazy all over the place and it, it would be easy to say that it's just because we're modern readers and we're used to much more modern mm -hmm. stuff but even compare it to drama of the 16 and 1700s compare it to shakespeare compare it to Marlowe. um the characters in this story are awful mm -hmm. very poorly developed very cardboard very predictable um, the circumstances, like she said, really are just stupid. ridiculous. They're all to really the point overly of being absurd. They're overly emotional. They're stupid. Mm -hmm. They make a ton of assumptions. They don't communicate well. And there are so many and weird circumstances. Prideful. Yeah, there's so many weird circumstances happen. that would not, yeah, are not would not occur. Like, like there's nothing about this story that makes any sense. <laughs> like it, the banter was funny like a mm -hmm. lot of like there's um a particular uh servant maid servant to uh princess matilda i can't yeah. really remember i think I it's beatrice either. or something or okay. no bianca okay i think her name's bianca but she is like the most beat around the bush gossipy bitch you've ever met <laughs> that the king <laughs> just wants a straight answer from her my thing is like what servant would beat around the bush so much with their own freaking king who has literally been screaming for people to get beheaded, thrown in prison, and hung all night. Afraid to tell him the truth. <laughs> yeah, but he, that's the thing. Like, she's not. She's mm. just beating around the bush. And I'm just like, no servant in their right mind would do that to a king who's already angry. Right. Even if you're the maidservant to a princess, that's still just a princess, and you're still just a servant. Mm-hmm. But I loved her banter because it was absolutely ridiculously silly. But still, so unrealistic. There's nothing about this. And the female characters are just chattel. Yeah. Nobody's really a prize. They're mm -hmm. all kind of basic, stupid people. Yeah, there's no Theodore, dimension to any of the characters. Theodore, like, mistakenly falls in love with the one of the other princesses. There are two princesses in this. And, like, he keeps mistaking one for the other all the time. Like, who the frick are you actually in love with, you dumb shit? Uh -huh. <laughs> like, can't even, can't even figure out what pr princess you're really talking to? You'd think mm -hmm. you'd know the difference. Mm -hmm. Nope. Just a moron. Anyway, uh, can't, uh, hated it. So stupid. <laughs> it was terrible. I shouldn't yeah. have even given it three stars. It should have been two. Just, yeah. So, uh, this is an important book historically yes but we've got to say to all readers today don't go into this book thinking you're gonna love it i mean what she said about about how absurd it is yes it also had an it's... influence on creating absurdist literature and surrealism the surrealists mm -hmm. uh, were influenced by this book a lot but all the people that were influenced by it did stuff that was light years better than the original. Mm -hmm. The original is a turkey. Yeah, I feel like the only, the only inspiring thing about this story is that it's so bad people wanted to be like, hey, I could do that better. Mm -hmm. That's literally <laughs> what happened here. Well, I mean, it opened up for the imagination. It did. It made people think, oh, I could take this idea and do way better than this guy did because mm -hmm. he's an asshat. Mm-hmm. And write this fantastic story, like Follow the House of Usher is a good Follow influence the House of Usher for this. Was, that was in translates by this. well, really well written. This mm -hmm. is not a top tale for me. No, it, it's no. definitely not getting on our, our list. But if you're curious, yeah. And uh, I actually went and I didn't pay much money for this. This is the Folio Society edition from I want to say 1970 something. Mm -hmm. I found it used. And upside down. 
expecting that I would like the book a lot more. Yes. But it is a pretty cool book. It, I do you know, like Folio the illustration. Folio Society does excellent books. It has some mm -hmm. excellent illustration, excellent typesetting. Yeah, that's really nice typography um, in very there. Easy, very easy to read. Ooh. I like their, the... Um, icons that they put on the chapters. Little ornaments It's a beautiful little book. Yeah, it is a really pretty little book. Unfortunately, the original came with a slipcase. This one, the slipcase is missing, but that's okay because it's... Oh, that's cool. Yeah, there, there's some really cool illustrations in here. So you can... There are some nice editions of Castle of Otranto out mm -hmm. there if you really really want to have it. Um, the book is better than the story. Yes. <laughs> it's honestly, like, it wasn't I don't want to bash it so much. I had a really hard time just because there was so much drama going on. Mm -hmm. But some people might like that. Like, Yeah, it, if you go into it, like, like yeah. you say, if you approach it as an absurdist comedy. Yeah, it is. It feels like an absurdist of... comedy, even though I don't think it was meant to be. I didn't think it was meant to be no. that either. But maybe he is cleverer than that. And, I don't know. And did like, it felt something like. something that's going to be an enigma for all the ages. All of us scratching our head is how could a book be so bad? <laughs> I think the best way I can describe how this book goes is it's like. An episode of Gilmore Girls, except the screenwriter was drunk, and it was medieval times. That's pretty okay. much the best way I can say. Like the banter is kind of that silly, fun, bickery, fast-paced, very emotionally charged banter, like Gilmore Girl, the TV show Gilmore Girls has. Mm -hmm. Except the writer was also drunk when he wrote it, so. There's a lot of like very overly, overly dramatic, irrationally reactionary, emotional stuff. Like that's all the action is, is just a bunch of misunderstandings and a bunch mm -hmm. of angry. Mm -hmm. And they're just blowing up at each other. Yeah. And stuff. And then there's some praying and then someone gets stabbed in a church. Mm -hmm. And that's how it goes. For me, it reminds me more of Dark Shadows. Yeah. Except Dark Shadows is better <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know i it's just it wasn't i don't want to bash it too much because someone actually might really oh, enjoy do. that this but I, <laughs> I just it made no sense like i've seen great absurd like i don't know if you're familiar with the t the movie hudson hawk at all mm -mm. that is another like absurdist comedy starring bruce willis okay where just when you think it can't lose its mind anymore it does, but it's <laughs> funny and it's great. And I've watched it 18 times after the first time I saw it because it was so funny. I, I felt like it's intentional. This is more like yeah, watching Plan 9 from Outer Space. It's kind of like <laughs> it's like you walk. It's like you're walking into a conversation halfway. Mm -hmm. And everyone's drunk and everything's on fire and there's giant a giant night ghost where on, who's dismembered and his stuff keeps appearing and it's part of this weird prophecy that I didn't even freaking understand. Like, what? That was a family curse. I Some know. Distant Some relative giant. <laughs> was, was coming back as a giant suit of armor. To and that was so, like, kind of glazed over so mm -hmm. much for most of the story mm -hmm. that you're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> Just, what? <laughs> like, they mentioned it briefly in the beginning. Don't mention it again. They just keep seeing these ghostly giant things everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like all these pieces of armor just disembodied but moving. Like I just imagined like the one on the stairs with the gauntlet. It's just like <laughs> walking down the stairs like a spider or uh -huh. something. I don't know. But it just it's like an episode of the Adams Family but worse. <laughs> That's actually funny. <laughs> like uh -huh. no. Not So action. okay. Not a top tail. No. Nope. Not recommended. Hated it. Tell um, us how much you hated it. <laughs> yeah, or loved it. Or if, loved if, it. If you disagree with us, argue in the comments. I will We'd fight you. <laughs> She'll fight you. I, I will fight you. Say, well, yeah, whatever. <laughs> she will have to delete my comments. I hated this so much. Okay, okay. but if you liked it, please do comment. Because, like, yeah. help me understand why it's good. I need that. Because if it is good and I'm wrong, someone needs to tell me how, because I, I don't see it. Yeah, it's hard to understand how this could launch so much great literature later, you know? Yeah, I would love to see people, if you could like <clears throat> post comments of versions you wrote yourself, 
of this book, it would be better than this book, I'm sure, no matter what your level of writing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it's definitely, it was an interesting read. It wasn't as cringy when I read it, but after the fact, I kind of like, what the hell did I just read? <laughs> anyway, so yeah, that's Castle of a Toronto. Yes, Good I... luck and Godspeed if you read it. <laughs> uh -huh. But like our channel, subscribe, let us know what you thought of if, if you read it. Let us know if you loved it or hate it. God help you. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.